Hello! It's Magda the Story Spider, and I don't look like myself. I know. I don't have the curly hair, the glasses, all that kind of stuff. Well, I'm not working tonight. Tonight, I have a special guest star, my friend John Davis. He's a local actor and playwright here in the Nashville area. And he's going to share something really great with you um, in honor of both Band Book Week, which was in September, and All Hallows Read, which, of course, is right now. If you want details about either one of those things, look in the comments section. But for now, here's John reading a Ray Bradbury story. Take it away. Okay. Hi, I'm John Davis. Um, I'd like to read for you a one of my favorite stories to read around a bonfire on Halloween night. Ray Bradbury's The Emissary. Martin knew that it was autumn again, for dog ran into the house, bringing wind and frost and a smell of apples turned to cider on trees. In dark clock springs of hair, dog fetched goldenrod, dust of farewell summer, acorn husk, hair of squirrel, feather of departed robin, sawdust from fresh cor cut cordwood, and leaves like charcoal shaken from a blaze of maple trees. Dog jumped. Showers of brittle fern, blackberry vine, marsh grass sprang over the bed where Martin shouted, No doubt, no doubt of it at all, this incredible beast was October. Here, boy, here. And dog settled to warm Martin's body with all the bonfires and subtle burnings of the season, to fill the room with soft or heavy, wet or dry odors of far traveling. In spring, he smelled of lilac, iris, lawn mowered grass. In summer, ice cream mustached, he came pungent with firecracker, Roman candle, pinwheel, baked by the sun. But autumn. Autumn. Dog, what's it like outside? And lying there, Dog told as he always told. Lying there, Martin found Autumn as in the old days before sickness bleached him white on his bed. Here was his contact, his carry-all, the quick-moving part of himself he sent with a yell to run and return, circle and scent, collect and deliver, the time and texture of worlds in town, country, by creek, river, lake, down cellar, up attic, in closet or coal bin. Ten dozen times a day he was gifted with sunflower, <clears throat> sunflower seed, cinder path, milkweed, horse chestnut, or full flame smell of pumpkin. Through the loomings of the universe, dog shuttled. The design was hid in his pelt. Put out your hand. It was there. And where did you go this morning? But he knew without hearing where dog had rattled down hills, where autumn lay in cereal crisp, crispness, where children lay in funeral pyres, in rustling heaps, the leaf buried but watchful dead. As dog and the world blew by, Martin trembled his fingers, searched the thick fur, read the long journey. Through the stubbled fields, over glitters of ravine creek, down marbled spread of cemetery yard, into woods, in the great season of spices and rare incense, now Martin ran through his emissary, around, about, and home. The bedroom door opened. That dog of yours is in trouble again. Mother brought in a tray of fruit salad, cocoa, and toast, her blue eyes snapping. Mother... Always digging places. Dug a hole in Mrs. Tarkin's garden this morning. She's spitting mad. That's the fourth hole he's dug there this week. Well, maybe he's looking for something. Fiddlesticks. He's too darn curious. If he doesn't behave, he'll be locked up. Martin looked at this woman as if she were a stranger. Oh, you, you wouldn't do that. How would I learn anything? How would I find things out if Dog didn't tell me? Mom's voice was quieter. Is that what he does? Tell you things? Oh, there's nothing I don't know when he goes out and around and back. Nothing I can't find out from him. 
They both sat looking at Dog and the dry stewings of mold and seed over the quilt. Well, if you'll just stop digging where he shouldn't, he can run all he wants, said Mother. Here, boy, here. And Martin snapped a tin note to Dog's collar. My owner is Martin Smith, ten years old, sick in bed, visitors welcome. Dog barked. Mother opened the downstairs door and let him out. Martin sat listening. Far off and away you could hear Dog run in the quiet autumn rain that was falling now. You could hear the barking, jingling, fade, rise, fade again as he cut down alley over lawn to fetch back Mr. Holloway and the oiled metallic smell of the delicate snowflake interior watches he repaired in his own shop. Or maybe he'd bring Mr. Jacobs, the grocer, whose clothes were rich with lettuce, celery, tomatoes, and the secret tinned and, hit and hidden smell of the red demons stamped on cans of deviled ham. Mr. Jacobs and his unseen pink meat devils waved often from the yard below. Or Dog bought, brought Mr. Jackson, Mrs. Gillespie, Mr. Smith, Mrs. Holmes, any friend or near friend, encountered, cornered, begged, worried, and at last shepherded home for lunch or, or tea and biscuits. Now listening, Mar Martin heard Dog below with his footsteps moving in a light rain behind him. The downstairs bell rang. Mom opened the door. Light voices murmured. Martin sat forward, face shining. The stair treads creaked. A young woman's voice laughed quietly. Miss Haight, of course, is teacher from school. The bedroom door sprang open. Martin had company. Morning, afternoon, evening, Dawn and dusk, sun and moon circled with Dog, who faithfully reported temperature of turf and air, color of earth and tree, consistency of mist or rain, but, most important of all, brought back again and again and again, Miss Haight. On Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, she baked Martin orange dice cupcakes brought him library books about dinosaurs and cavemen. On Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, somehow he beat her at dominoes. Somehow she lost at checkers. And soon she cried he'd defeat her handsomely at chess. On Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, they talked and never stopped talking. And she was so young and laughing and handsome, and her hair was soft and shining, brown like the season outside the window, and she walked Clear, clean, and quick, a heartbeat warm in the bitter afternoon when he heard it. Above all, she had the secret of signs. She could read and interpret dog and the symbols, uh, and the symbols she searched out and plucked forth from his coat with her miraculous fingers. Eyes shut, softly laughing, in a gypsy's voice, she divined the world from the treasures in her hands. And on Monday afternoon, Miss Height was dead. Martin sat up in bed slowly. Dead? He whispered. Dead, said his mother. Yes, dead. Killed in an auto accident a mile out of town. Dead. Yes, dead. Which meant cold to Martin. Which meant silence and whiteness and winter come long before his time. Dead. Silent, cold, white. The, so the thoughts circled around, blew down, and settled in whispers. Martin held dog, thinking, turned to the wall. The lady with the autumn colored hair. The lady with the laughter. And it was so very gentle, and never made fun. The eyes that watched your mouth see everything you ever said. The other half of Autumn Lady, who told what was left untold by Dog about the world. The heartbeat at the still center of a gray afternoon. The heartbeat fading. Mom, 
What do they do in the graveyard, Mom? Under the ground? Just lay there? Lie there. Lie there? That all they do? It doesn't sound like much fun. For goodness sake, it's not made out to be fun. Why don't they jump up and run around once in a while? They get tired lying there. God's pretty silly. Martin! Well, you'd think he'd treat people better than that, than to tell them to lie skill, still for keeps. That's impossible. Nobody can do it. I, I tried once. Dog tries. I tell him, dead dog. And he plays dead a while, and then he gets sick and tired and wags his tail or opens one eye and looks at me bored. Boy, I bet sometimes those graveyard people do the same thing, huh, dog? Dog barked. Be still with that kind of talk, said Mother. Martin looked off into space. But that's exactly what they do, he said. Autumn burnt the trees bare, and ran dogs still further around, fording creek prowling graveyard as it was his custom, and back in dusk to fire off volleys of barking that shook windows wherever he turned. In the late last days of October, dog began to act as if the wind had changed and blew from a strange country. He stood quivering on the porch below. He whined, his eyes fixed at the empty land beyond town. He brought no visitors for Martin. He stood for hours each day as if leashed, trembling, then shot away, straight as if someone had called. Each night he returned later, with no one following. Each night Martin sank deeper and deeper in his pillow. Well, people are busy, said Mother. They haven't time to notice the tag dog carries, or, or they mean to come and visit, but they forget. But there was more to it than that. There was the fevered shining in Dog's eyes, and his whimpering tick late at night in some private dream, his shivering in the dark under the bed, the way he sometimes stood half the night, looking at Martin as if some great and impossible secret was his, and he knew no way to tell it save by savagely thumping his tail or turning in endless circles, never to lie down, spinning, spinning again. On October 30th, Dog ran out and didn't come back at all. Even when after supper Martin heard his parents call and call, the hour grew late, the streets and sidewalks stood empty, the air moved cold about the house, and there was nothing, nothing. Long after midnight, Martin lay watching the world beyond the cool, clear glass windows. Now there was not even autumn, for there was no dog to fetch it in. There would be no winter, for who could bring the snow to melt in your hands? Father? Mother? No. Not the same. They couldn't play the game with its special secrets and rules its sounds and pantomimes. No more seasons. No more time. The go-between, the emissary, was lost to the wild throngings of civilization. Poisoned, stolen, hit by a car, left somewhere in a culvert. Sobbing, Martin turned his face to, to his pillow. The world was a picture under glass, untouchable. The world was dead. Martin twisted in his bed, and in three days the last Halloween pumpkins were rotting in trash cans. Paper mache skulls and witches were burnt on bonfires, and ghosts were stacked on shelves with other linens until next year. To Martin, Halloween had been nothing more than one evening when the horns cried off in the cold autumn stars, 
Children's blue like goblin leaves among the fil flinty walks, flinging their heads or cabbages at porches, soap writing names or similar magic symbols on icy windows. All of it is distant, unfathomable, and nightmares is a puppet show, seen from so many miles away that there's no sound or meaning. For three days in November, Martin watched alternate light and shadow sift across his ceiling. The fire pageant was over forever. Autumn low, lay in cold ashes. Martin sank deeper, yet deeper, in the white marble layers of bed, motionless, listening, always listening. Friday, Friday evening, his parents kissed him goodnight, walked out of the house into the hushed cathedral weather toward a motion picture show. Miss Tarkins from next door stayed on in the parlor below until Martin called down he was sleepy, then took her knitting off home. In silence, Martin lay following the great move of stars down a clear and moonlit sky, remembering nights such as this when he'd spanned the town with dog ahead, behind, around about, tracking the green plush ravine, lapping slumberous streams gone milky with the fullness of the moon, leaping cemetery tombstones while whispering the mar marble names, on, quickly on, through shaved meadows, where the only motion was the off-on quivering of stars, to streets where shadows would not stand aside for you, but crowded all the sidewalks for mile on mile. Run now, run! Chasing, being chased by bitter smoke, fog, mist, wind, ghost of mind, fright of memory, home, safe, sound, snug warm, asleep. Nine o'clock. Chime. The drowsy clock in the deep stairwell below. Chime. Dog, come home and run the world with you. Dog, bring a thistle with frost on it or bring nothing else but the wind. Dog, where are you? Listen now, I'll call. Martin held his breath, way off somewhere, a sound. Martin rose up, trembling. There again, the sound, so small a sound, like a sharp needle point brushing the sky long miles, many, many miles away. The dreamy echo of a dog barking. The sound of a dog crossing fields and farms, dirt roads and rabbit paths, running, running, letting out great barks of steam, cracking the night, sound of a circling dog which came and went lifted and faded opened up shut in moved forward went back as if the animal were were kept by someone on a fantastically long chain as if the dog were running and somehow whistled under chestnut trees in mold shadow tar shadow moon shadow walking and the dog circled back and sprang out again toward home Dog, thought Martin. Oh, dog, come home, boy. Listen. Oh, listen, where have you been? Come on, boy. Make tracks. Five, ten, fifteen minutes. Near, very near. The bark, the sound. Martin cried out, thrust his feet from the bed, leaned to the window. Dog, listen, boy. Dog, dog. He said it over and over. Dog, dog. Wicked dog run off and gone all these days? Bad dog. Good dog. Homeboy, hurry. Bring what you can. Near now, 
near, up the street, barking to knock clambered house fronts with sound, whirl iron cocks on the rooftops in, in the moon, firing off volleys. Dog, now at the door below. Martin shivered. Should he run? Let dog in? Or wait for mom and dad? It, wait? Oh, God, wait? But what if dog ran off again? No, no, he'd go down. He'd snatch the door wide, yell, grab dog in, and run upstairs so fast, laughing, crying, holding tight that... Dog stopped barking. Hey! Martin almost broke the window, jerking to it. Silence. As if someone had told dog to hush now. Hush. Hush. A full minute passed. Martin clenched his fists. Below, faint whimpering. And then slowly, the downstairs front door opened. So someone was kind enough to have opened the door for Dog, of course. Martin had brought Mr. Jacobs, or Mr. Gillespie, or Miss Tarkins, or... The downstairs door shut. Dog raced upstairs, whining, flung himself on the bed. Dog! Dog, where have you been? What have you done? Dog! Dog! And he crushed Dog hard and long to himself, weeping. Dog! Dog! He laughed and shouted, Dog! But after a moment... He stopped laughing and crying suddenly. He pulled back away. He held the animal and looked at him, his eyes widening. The odor coming from dog was different. It was a smell of strange earth. It was a smell of night within night. The smell of digging down deep in shadow through earth that had lain cheek by jowl with things that were long hidden and decayed. A stinking and rancid, rancid soil fell away in clods of dissolution from dog's muzzle and paws. He had dug deep. He had dug very, very deep indeed. That was it, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Wasn't it? What kind of message was this from Dog? What could such a message mean? The stench. The ripe and awful cemetery earth. Dog was a bad dog. Digging where he shouldn't. Dog was a good dog. Always making friends. Dog loved people. Dog brought them home. And now, moving up the dark hall stairs, at intervals, came the sound of feet, one foot dragging after the other, painfully, slowly, slowly, slowly. Dog shivered. A rain of strange night earth fell seething on the bed. Dog turned. The bedroom door whispered in. Martin had company. 